I want to thank everyone for joining us today as we review the FDA's fiscal year 25 budget request. Our witness is the Commissioner of the FDA, Dr. Robert Califf. Dr. Califf, I want to welcome you to today's hearing. I look forward to the discussion on not only the budget request, but issues and challenges that face the FDA. I want to recognize the critical work that occurs at the FDA touching the lives of every American every day. While it's not always flawless, America continues to be blessed with the safest food and drug supply in the world. But as I look at the FDA's budget request, I'd be remiss if I did not once again acknowledge federal spending in general. We need to take an overall look at our spending on both the discretionary and mandatory leg ledgers. Every day, Americans are being squeezed by unrelenting inflation, a product of years of overspending that only accelerated under the Biden administration and continues under this year's president's budget. The budget request put forth by the administration while more reasonable than previous years, still increases federal spending and ignores our current fiscal environment and crushing federal debt and deficit. For FY25, FDA's request totals $7.2 billion, <clears throat> which is $500 million above the FY24 enacted level. This increase includes approximately $160 million in new budget authority and $388 million from increased or new user fees. I understand that the marketplace is growing ever more complex, and the FDA is constantly trying to adapt to the changes. I also realize there are business cases for certain increases or initiatives, and this subcommittee will fully analyze those. But I also know there's room for improvement in utilizing existing resources. Over the last 10 years, FDA's budget authority has increased over $1 billion, or 45 percent, in budget authority alone to, to meet operational needs address crises, and invest in new technologies to advance drug and device safety. Over the past few years, the Appropriations Committees, in a bipartisan and bicameral effort, have been pressing FDA to be more transparent in how resources are being utilized. Now, I do acknowledge FDA has taken some steps to be more transparent with spending, but I feel that more work remains. As I noted, the budget request seeks an additional $500 million, which is a significant increase. This committee needs more transparency to know what is happening with the resources we have already provided, and we want to work constructively with the FDA to maximize resources. Funds that we provide in FY25 need to come with accountability measures. Aside from funding, I have concerns on certain actions that have taken place at the FDA, resulting in credibility challenges in the eyes of the American public. First, as a physician, I have serious concerns about the actions FDA took when recommending to the Drug Enforcement Administration the rescheduling of marijuana. The two-factor authentication test utilized by FDA lacks both substance and data. It seems the FDA ignored several important factors when considering marijuana's potential for abuse and harm to public health, including, but not limited to, daily marijuana use, health damage caused by traffic fatalities due to individuals driving under the influence of marijuana, and the impact of marijuana on pregnant women and children. We can talk about this more in depth, and we will, but I have long said the American people deserve to know the effect of modern marijuana has on the human body. I'm also very concerned about widespread drug and device shortages. This year, we've unfortunately broken a record, a record for drug shortages, with a record 323 medications in shortage now. Many of these shortages are caused by safety concerns identified in overseas manufacturing facilities in China and India. Rather than the FDA shifting its focus to react to the shortages when they occur, I think we need to work together to address the root causes of these shortages. I'd like to further discuss FDA's regulatory oversight of imported drugs and opportunities to bolster domestic manufacturing, particularly for generic drugs, frequently the ones that are in shortage. On the food side, we're looking forward to the establishment of the Unified Human Food Program and establishing a new model for the Office of Regulatory Affairs. ORA performs many of the FDA's field-based operations and will be renamed the Office of Inspections and Investigations. We're ready to see the anticipated improvements these reforms will bring and recognize the effort that has gone into this reorganization. This undertaking will hopefully go a long way toward instilling some of the confidence that has been lost in recent years. Unfortunately, other controversies continue to swirl around the agency, disrupting public confidence. In particular, FDA's continued inability to clear the market of illicit tobacco products. 
I simply do not understand why FDA cannot or will not tackle this problem head on and get illicit product products out of the marketplace. This should be the Center for Tobacco Products' number one focus, not dreaming up new rulemakings to further exacerbate black markets. Dr. Califf, we're eager to hear how you'll address these issues, and I look forward to working with you, and I appreciate you being with us for today's hearing. Now I'll turn to our distinguishing ranking member, Mr. Bishop, for any opening remarks he may have. Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Commissioner Califf, uh, for joining us today to discuss the FY25 budget requests for the Food and Drug Administration. The FDA plays a crucial role in ensuring that Americans have access to the safest and most affordable food, as well as cutting-edge medicine and medical devices. To do this, Congress must ensure that the FDA has the resources and the workforce that it needs, as well as the ability to be guided by sound science, free from political persuasion, uh, to fulfill its mission and maintain the public trust. Yet, I expect much of our conversation today to focus on accountability and transparency in how the FDA moves forward. So much has taken place in the two years since you were confirmed, from the infant formula crisis, to the human, fo human foods reorganization. Now we have ongoing our product recalls and record high drug shortages. When you were here last year, we discussed my concerns regarding domestic and foreign inspections. In addition to our concerns with the safety of our food and drug supply, we must remain vigilant about ensuring tainted black market and underground economy trading illicit products such as alcohol, firearms, biological organs, and tobacco are not making their way into the country. We are aware of the Chinese and the Mexican cartels' efforts to profit off the illicit market. And I look forward to hearing from you, Commissioner, about how the FDA is working in conjunction with its partners in the federal government to ensure that illicit products containing potentially deadly chemicals like fentanyl are not making it into the country. Our domestically produced agriculture is subject to rigorous oversight that will most certainly not be the case for illicit products that are trafficked by criminal enterprises and organizations. Furthermore, it appears that FDA uh, intends to cut funding from state and local inspection programs after years of moving those funds to other priorities. So I'm curious to know how this has and will affect FDA's work here at home. The stakes are high and people's lives are at stake. And it's reasonable to say that your response to these challenges has a tremendous impact on our country's security and Americans' well-being. So I look forward to hearing from you how FDA is providing Americans with access to the highest quality, the safest, the most abundant and affordable food, fiber, medicine, and medical devices. I look forward to your testimony, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Kayla, for that objection, your entire written testimony will be included in the record. I now recognize you for your statement, and then we'll proceed with questions. Thanks much. Chairman Harris, Ranking Member Bishop, and members of the subcommittee, thanks for the opportunity to appear before you today. I'd like to start by thanking the subcommittee for your continued support of FDA in a difficult fiscal environment. The agency greatly appreciates the subcommittee's sustained commitment to our mission and providing vital resources critical to FDA's protection of the public health and safety and for addressing ongoing and emerging challenges. The budget I'm pleased to present to you today requests a total of $7.22 billion for the agency, an increase of $341 million above the FY 2024 enacted levels. This increase in funding will allow the agency to continue to leverage new and emerging technologies, as well as providing for immediate and lasting impacts on our work by incorporating new technologies and fostering innovation. Looking ahead to FY 2025, we intend to take significant new steps in our approach to addressing our numerous challenges, in particular through the largest reorganization in FDA's recent history. Virtually every component of the agency will be impacted in some way by the changes which will affect over 8,000 of our 18,000 employees. At the center of this reorganization 
we're building a newly unified human foods program. Following the independent evaluation by the Reagan Udall Foundation and an internal review, we're bringing together human foods functions, resources, and personnel from across the agency, all under a single leader. Importantly, this new human foods program will create a clear line of authority. The new deputy commissioner has full decision-making authority over the entire program, including setting strategic direction for food inspections, as well as work planning, risk prioritization, and program resources allocation. We're also uh, renaming the Office of Regulatory Affairs, as the chair has noted, as the Office of Inspections and Investigations and refocusing the office on its core functions of inspections, investigations, and import operations, eliminating duplication and increasing efficiency in how we handle these activities. As part of this effort, we're shifting the Office of Regulatory Affairs, Medical Products, Tobacco Products, and Specialty Labs into the Office of the Chief Scientist to form a highly integrated network of laboratories and laboratory scientists that provides coordinated cut, cutting edge regulatory science research and support for all the FDA. Additionally, we're making a number of other realignments to further improve efficiency and communication across the agency, including moving cosmetics functions to the office of the chief scientist, which is best positioned to support scientific expertise necessary to review cosmetic ingredients and implement the new authorities provided under the Modernization Cosmetics Regulation Act. The FY 2025 budget request will provide a solid foundation for these newly envisioned programmatic changes. Outside the reorganization, we're also looking to make significant strides in other critical cross-cutting areas. For example, the past four years have demonstrated the importance of managing supply chains and mitigating shortages of critical products. Our FY25 budget requests $12.3 million for supply chain work across nearly all product areas, as well as establishing positions to coordinate these activities across the agency. This will advance FDA's capabilities to help prepare for, build resilience to, and respond to shortages that are supply-driven, demand-driven, or both, through improved analytics and regulatory approaches. Finally, I also want to emphasize the importance of the agency's modernization of IT infrastructure and data processes. We're requesting an increase of $8.3 million to further build on our centralized enterprise data modernization capabilities, as well as $2 million to implement common business processes and data optimization. Data and information are at the center of everything that we do, and we need technology that enables our workforce to do their jobs with modern efficiencies and analytical knowledge that's now possible because of the rapidly changing underlying technology. The rapidly changing world demands that our systems evolve to meet future needs. This includes incorporation of computing advances that enable cybersecurity and artificial intelligence. While we're in the midst of a challenging budget environment, I'd like to again thank the subcommittee for its ongoing support of our work, and I look forward to continuing this partnership. Thanks for inviting me today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Califf, and we'll begin the, the questions, and I'll uh, first uh, yield to Mr. Valadeo. Commissioner Califf, thank you for being here today. Um, I represent California Central Valley, which is the largest milk shed in the United States. My dairy farmers face numerous regulatory pressures at both state and federal levels to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Our opportunity for producers rests on FDA approval of animal feed ingredients that have a proven track record of reducing methane emissions. Currently, these feed ingredients have to go through a burdensome drug approval process. The FDA announced the withdrawal of policy procedures, um, the withdrawal of policy procedures manual 12403605, which to, was designed to allow these feed ingredients to go under the feed ingredient review process for an ad hoc basis. Many dairy producers are interested in using these products in a voluntary manner, but can't do that until the FDA approves them. Can you give us an update on your agency's efforts to approve these products? Um, much appreciate the question. I've been very involved in um, all the discussions involving the Center for Veterinary mm -hmm. Medicine. We recognize um, everything you said is very important for our future and the future of the industry. And so um, and for the time being, we are encouraging people to come in early and often to discuss with us how to get these products through the evaluation. And I want to, I, I always feel the need to stress that um, 
we're looking to approve if the criteria are met for being a safe and effective product. So I prefer to call it evaluation rather than just approval. But the promise of this for our future um, as a human race is really substantial. I'd also say that um, you know the current regulations are not optimal for doing this, so we're having to really bend uh, the regulations with a lot, all the flexibilities that we can offer, which we're definitely interested in doing. But we'd really like to work with you on having legislation that creates a pathway that's effective for these um, products. And I know there have been discussions that have already come quite far in that regard. We'd like to continue with those discussions and, and move this along. All right. Well, um, on traceability, There it is. Um, the, food, uh, the food distribution industry is extremely concerned with the industry being able to comply with these regulations by the current deadline of January 2026. While they fully support these improved food safety and traceability initiatives, they worry that there simply hasn't been enough time to, or outreach to pr uh, prepare the entire supply chain for these changes. How engaged have you been with the industry uh, on the establishment of these rules across the supply chain? We've been very engaged with numerous uh, listening sessions, interchanges, discussions. As far as uh, the cost uh, and feasibility of implementing these rules, you've been engaged in this as well? Absolutely engaged. I, I, the place, so here's, uh, as I get older, I'm uh, more and more see where we have these tensions that exist, and this is clearly a place. I assume almost everyone would agree that when we have food outbreaks, the most effective way to figure out what's causing the problem is going to be through a digital traceability system, which technology can fully support at this time. On the other hand, it's a big adaptation for the industry. So we have to, the system won't work if the industry can't adapt to it. So we're currently in a process of figuring out uh, what's going to work for the industry. But on the other hand, I think the public rightly would expect that um, we should be able to speed up our getting to the source of food outbreaks when they do occur. And so this traceability through digital means is really an essential component of that. Well, and that's the thing, uh, at least us as farmers, this is something that a lot of us take um, a lot of pride in. I think we do a pretty good job of having mechanisms in place to be able to trace where our food comes from. I mean, for profitability, knowing exactly what field is producing or which corral is producing or uh, where the animals are coming from, making sure you're using the best quality genetics, the only way to know if those genetics are performing is to follow that. And so I know a lot of folks in the agricultural world are already doing these things. I hope the FDA works with the farmers on this and continues to progress in a way that works for both sides of this argument. If I could, if I could comment, I mean, I've done a lot of reflection in preparing for this meeting and last week's oversight meeting. I don't want to be misinterpreted when I um, talk about this because fundamentally our regulatory system is built where the first line of defense is what you said. It's the regulated industry doing what it's supposed to do. And overwhelmingly, um, Americans do what they're supposed to do if it's a, on a farm or if it's manufacturing a product. And so it's mostly successful. Okay. But sometimes things don't work. And I would just point out with regard to farms, often it's not the farm, it's something upstream from the farm. So the traceability is really meant to track the product okay, all the way through. Real quick question. Have you been able to visit an infant formula production facility yourself in person since the out, some issues we had last year? I've not been, not been to a facility in person, but I've met with the leadership and also the people doing the quality control at the facilities multiple times, including just this week. Um, had a major meeting um, about the quality systems with a, a major manufacturer. All right. Well, thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, welcome, Dr. Caleb. Uh, we've heard very troubling rumors that the FDA is planning to cut funding for state and local food safety inspection programs by about $34 million in 2025. Uh, state and local inspectors are FDA's right hand uh, when it comes to inspections, and they conducted nearly 5,700 inspections in 2023 uh, at a very modest cost. Is this true? And if so, why would you do this with nearly $1.1 billion in increased budget authority since 2014? 
it seems very, very hard to believe that you can't find $34 million. And the second question, uh, just quickly, uh, you can pivot to uh, restarting the unannounced inspections of drug manufacturing facilities in foreign countries has been a priority of the subcommittee on a bipartisan basis. And last year, you said that FDA would be starting the China part of this effort in May of 2023. Uh, this is in addition to the ongoing work in India. Uh, can you give us an update on both parts of the pilot? Sure, glad to, and thank you for those uh, questions. So first of all, we're not, we're not proposing a cut. Uh, you have generously appropriated $83 million every year um, for the states, and we acknowledge and, in fact, are excited about the relationships with the states. It's a major part of our reorganization to optimize our interactions with the states, the territories, and the tribes. A very large number of inspections are done by them, approximately half on the food side, as you, as you said. But the what happens is not that, true. What's that? The rumor is not true. Well, let me explain where we are, though. So the $83 million is what's appropriated. Every year for the past number of years, we've scrounged around to find additional dollars to give to the states because we feel that um, it's so important, as you're pointing out. <clears throat> and so we've gone beyond what was appropriated to support the states. And what we've done is to um, let the states know that Fiscal times are tighter. We don't have excess money to um, move around to meet needs. Um, we have a lot of needs and a growing number of things we have to look out for. So there's, there's going to be um, some negotiation that needs to go on state by state, as there already is. But we don't have that extra money. Sounds like a yes. Well, it's extra money that's not appropriated for that um, purpose. So um, that's, that's where we are. With regard to the unannounced inspections, um, we're up to almost 100 now in India, and we're in double digits in China. And what we've learned so far is that we can do it. It costs more than two times as much for each inspection because of the logistics, the support that's needed, the travel. We've got to have at least two inspectors in each of those, not just one, because we're in an uh, unfamiliar uh, territory. Um, and the inspect, but the inspections can be done, and uh, we're going to continue with that. And you know, I remind you, I've been an inspectee in multiple dimensions of my previous career, so I do appreciate the importance of both announced and unannounced inspections. So we're going to continue um, with this to the extent we can. I'm sure later on in this meeting we'll talk about our dependence on China right now, which is a major problem for us, and it's not easy to do an inspection. Um, in China right now, but we are doing it. Well, that's a concern. Let me move on to the food traceability rule. Understand that traceability is essential when there's a food safety outbreak, and I know that you've been working with industry on issues uh, with regard to a final rule, which is 179 pages long. Uh, I've introduced a bill with uh, Mr. Franklin and Mr. Panetta that requires FDA to run pilots uh, before the rule takes effect. I'd like to ask you whether you think industry is ready to take on this enormous task of implementing the food traceability rule. If not, uh, would you commit to doing pilots first or at least delaying the compliance date? Well, I can't speak about specific pending legislation, but what I can, uh, as I discussed uh, with Mr. Molinar's question, there's a tension here. The industry has to be ready to do it for it to work. Uh, the industry is not going to get ready unless there's some pressure to make it happen because there are a lot of demands on industry's time. But I think the public health, as you've said, this is an essential uh, tool that we need for food safety. So we're in the process now having multiple interactions with the industry to try to figure out uh, the best time schedule. Um, your suggestion of pilot studies is, is duly noted. We will have to have some phasing in. We're well aware of that. Uh, my 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 think my uh, opinion of regulations is sound science, uh, cost benefit analysis, and common sense. My time is expired, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Bishop. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Commissioner, for being here. I too, uh, I, I appreciate your comments about the phased, potentially phased approach to the traceability rule uh, to allow for these complex formatting questions to be worked out. So I appreciate those comments. 
Um, I want to thank the FDA for approving quite a few life-saving medications that can be used for overdose reversal this past year. Uh, you know, we have an epidemic of drug overdoses across our country, in my district, and just about every other district in the country. Um, in addition, I applaud approving overdose reversal drugs like Narcan to over-the-counter. However, as you are aware, Americans are continuing to overdose every day. Can you provide an update on what the FDA is doing to approve more reversal drugs, including generics? Um, not only is our door wide open for um, additional medications in this regard, but we facilitate the industry and will continue to do so to meet the criteria. Um, uh, generics are going to be an important part of this to bring the price down. Um, it does that, and so we're just going to facilitate as much as we possibly can. I know you're aware that there are multiple other components to this crisis now that are taking precedence that have to do with law enforcement, really, uh, because of manufacturing of illicit fentanyl, which is not even part of the regular drug supply. So there are many other, um, and, and I'm happy to discuss any of those. Not happy about the problem, but um, we're taking it very seriously. Thank you. In 2007, Congress created the Tropical Disease Priority Review Voucher Program to provide an important incentive for the development of drugs and biologics to prevent or treat tropical diseases. While the FDA is required to establish and update a list of tropical diseases that qualify for the program, this list has not been updated since July of 2020. My understanding is that there are 10 new diseases that are awaiting a decision uh, by the FDA. The Further Consolidated Appropriations Act, which was recently signed into law, included report language that directs FDA to maintain the necessary resources to evaluate PRV candidates in a timely manner. Does the FDA anticipate making a decision on whether any of the, these diseases qualify for the PRV this year? And if not, when do you anticipate FDA action on these applications? Much appreciate the question. You're giving me some news I was not aware of. Um, we'll have to get back with you. And you know I can't give exact time frames, but um, from everything you've said, we'll have to move as quickly as we can to get these decisions made. Okay. Thank you. In February of this year, the Total Product Expo took place in Las Vegas. The expo's purpose was to showcase vapor products to independent retailers. But in reality, it was an open air market for Chinese manufacturers to sell illicit vapor products. Um, I understand that you were made aware of the potential for illicit manufacturers to attend this expo ahead of time uh, in a letter sent to you before the expo from Senators Bud and Tillis. FDA was present at the expo, but did not take any interest in the illegal products being sold all about them. Um, even worse, after the expo concluded, your agency has failed to take any action against any of the manufacturers present at the expo, despite their clear and flagrant violation of the law. Why did you refuse to take any action during the Vegas expo, especially since FDA staff was present witnessing this illegal activity? And do you plan to take action against any of the manufacturers who were selling illegal products at the Vegas ex expo? You know, Chinese producers are just uh, flooding the market and with dangerous illegal products, and we need to address that. Well, I, I don't agree we didn't take interest. Uh, we did see the letter. Um, we were there. Um, our strategies, um, I'm going to run out of time here. Can I go a little over on this answer? I think this is very important. If, if not, I can answer other. I, I will yield extra time. Yeah. Dr. Um, if I may, let me just start at the beginning on this, because I think if there's one thing that's bipartisan, and I heard a lot about this last week at the oversight hearing, uh, the Chinese imports of vaping products. So uh, to get to the basics, um, you know, tobacco, the leading cause of reversible death that we have right now, vaping, where the only health benefit that we know of of nicotine is in helping people stop who are using combustible tobacco. There is no health benefit of nicotine. Nicotine causes a fierce addiction. Um, the Chinese have gotten into uh, manufacturing. Our markets have taken them up. Uh, we have massive amounts coming in uh, through the import system, and we have 300,000 retail stores that are selling um, these products. It's uh, every time we do something like intercede and make a seizure, we have to document everything and be prepared for a course ca court case because in this country, by law, we have to treat 
um, offshore and internal people with the same rights in terms of their products. So it's a huge expenditure of resources. So um, I'm incensed by this because um, here we, and, and just to add to the insult, in China, it's illegal to sell flavored vapes to people in China, only tobacco flavored vapes. So they're manufacturing products that they're selling to us to addict our teenagers and children um, like TikTok. in massive amounts. It's like what, what Chinese so, children are exposed to on TikTok. I, I've, I've had some, uh, I, I won't say sleepless nights. I used to be an ICU doc. I think Dr. Harris understands this. I get sleep whenever I can. But if anything may, would make me sleepless right now, this is one of several issues. My suggestion, and this is not uh, an administration policy or even an FDA policy now, I think we need to work with Congress to come up with a way to deal with this specific problem that cuts all of the red tape that we have to go through. Because if you think about it, it's not as if people don't see it coming in. It's just, if you went, I would urge you to go and just look, do a tour of the international mail facility and see the work that has to go into documenting every single item that comes in. And there are many legal tricks that are used on the way in. Like when I made my last trip to an import space, the boxes full of vaping products were labeled um, as lanterns. That creates a legal problem for us because we have to go by what's on the label. Then it takes weeks to get that fixed and through the legal process. And by then, there's a time frame by which if we don't do something, the product goes on through. Yeah. And so, you know, my general theme, what I've come to realize, pardon the sports analogy, but at FDA, we're like referees. We're, we have a rule book, which you write as Congress. And I would at least urge you to think about this particular issue as one by which a specific rule might allow the referees to act uh, quickly without all the things that are bogging us down. I think we'd like to work with you on that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Lee? Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, first, let me uh, thank you for the FDA's work uh, last October in sending an, a rule to prohibit um, menthol cigarettes. Uh, thank you, uh, and the White House also, for the final approval. But uh, I'm very disappointed that uh, we haven't seen the finalized rule yet. The health impacts of menthol cigarettes uh, have been studied by FDA for more than a decade. Menthol cigarettes uh, cool and numb the throat, as you know, making it easier for kids to, stop, to start smoking. And they're also more addictive and harder to quit. For too long, of course, tobacco companies um, have engaged in predatory behaviors, specifically uh, marketed menthol cigarettes to the black community, specifically black youth. This explains uh, why currently 85% of uh, African-American adults smoke menthol cigarettes compared to 30% of non-Hispanic white smokers. More than 123 leading civil rights organizations, public health, medical, faith, youth-serving organizations have urged the Biden administration to actually finalize this rule. So uh, can you um, let us know when it will be finalized and what the holdups are and how we can move this along. I think you know I'm a cardiologist and I practiced in North Carolina for um, 35 years. I probably have seen more people die from tobacco related illness than almost any physician because I was an intensivist who dealt uh, with the end stage of the disease. This is a top priority for us. Um, but when we um, make a final rule, it goes through an intensive um, interagency process, and that's where it is right now. I can't give details about dates um, at this point. I'll just say from the point of view of the FDA and me as an individual, given what I've seen in my life, we're talking about over the next 30 years probably 600,000 um, deaths that could be averted. And most of these, as you duly note, uh, are in African-American people have been targeted um, by the industry uh, for the sale of these products. So I'm with you all the way, but I can't give details about the interagency process. Okay, the interagency process is cumbersome, but I mean, we have an idea, some based on prior 
uh, experience with rulemaking. Six months, a year, three years? Uh, I mean, I, do you have a sort of a time frame? Whatever decisions are made, I mean, this you know this doesn't sit around for three years. Well. You know? But I can't give an exact time. I, I really am prohibited from doing that. Nor time frame. I mean, do you think by the end of the year? It's, a, it's one of our top priorities, so I would sure hope so. Okay, uh, let me go further then and just ask you uh, in terms of, and, I, and your history is remarkable in terms of understanding this issue very clearly, in terms of uh, just black deaths uh, specifically. Have you, uh, you said 600,000 deaths. Can you repeat what you said about 600,000 deaths? We'll be able to save 600,000, or we've already been impacted by it? No, that's, uh, that's the projection of the projection. lives that would okay. be saved. And so every day that goes by that this is not um, enacted, um, it, you can count up the number of people um, who will die. And I, you know, I emphasize again that the, the keys here, and it refers a little bit back to the vaping um, issue too, um, the issue is nicotine is a very addictive substance. Uh, when people are targeted to make the nicotine, e the tobacco easier to tolerate in the lungs, which you pointed out, then people are hooked, and it is very difficult to stop. I have a close family member who's a brilliant person who has been addicted, having started as a teenager in North Carolina, and it is very hard to stop. There are 70 carcinogens in cigarette smoke. Um, but if you look even at vaping, there are a large number of um, things that, uh, I'm a cardiologist, I love the heart. You know, it pumps, you have to have it beating every day. The lungs, though, are amazing. The surface area of the lungs is, are the size of a tennis court. The alveoli, the little things that are there to bring oxygen into the body and um, eliminate CO2. And when we put other stuff in there, it's a very absorptive mechanism yeah. that gets things into the body that cause cancer and heart disease. Do you know, do you have any numbers in terms of how many black deaths could have been <clears throat> prevented um, because of the, these delays now? I don't have it at my fingertips, but the calculation is not hard to do. Okay, could, could we get that? Because I worry that by dragging this out, However, and for whatever reason, we're going to lose more lives uh, each and every I, day. I, I know the numbers sound abstract to other people. I'm glad that you're um, pressing on this. To me, as an intensive care cardiologist, these are not abstract numbers. These are real people that I've seen die, suffer from strokes, heart failure, um, and cancer um, in all parts of the body. So um, I hope we can get this done quickly. Okay, thank you, and I look forward to getting those numbers back. Thank you again. No, thank you very much for bringing up a very important issue. I recognize the gentlelady from Iowa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good morning, uh, Dr. Caleb. Thank you so much for coming before us, Commissioner. appreciate you being here. Um, I, I wanted to talk about the uh, ongoing shortages of several medications, including lisdexamphetamine, L um, LDX, um, other amphetamines such as Adderall. I think um, this underscores kind of a... Um, a complex crisis within our pharmaceutical supply chain. We've certainly heard a lot about it in our office. Um, I think it um, not only jeopardizes patient care, but it also reveals um, a challenge kind of at the intersection of regulatory oversight, um, market dynamics, and then, of course, the manufacturing side as well. Um, a holistic examination reveals the interplay between DEA's annual production quotas, um, FDA's regulatory oversight, and the influence of um, GPOs. Um, obviously, this is kind of the complex ecosystem that we're working within. So um, my question is, what formal communications are happening between FDA and DEA when DEA is working through those annual production quotas? And is that communication part of the public record um, uh, and open for comment? Um, it, it is a complex issue for the, re the reason that, and, and to just put it sort of on the table, um, Stimulants for um, ADHD um, are highly effective. The, the uh, evidence is very positive and getting more positive by the day that this is an effective treatment. Mm -hmm. There are also non-stimulant treatments that look like they're probably as, about as effective, but that's not the main issue here. We're also seeing an increase in stimulants 
as part of the overdose cocktail with the fentanyl. Um, and, and we don't have good data about whether that really is related to the prescriptions that are being written. And so the DEA has got to weigh those factors when it makes a decision about the quota that it allows the manufacturers to produce. But these are United States manufacturers that are heavily regulated um, and have a track record of producing these drugs in a responsible manner. Um, I've got one in my district that's um, in, the, in the waiting game, right, constantly waiting for these quotas. They are having to put staff on hold. I mean, it is a real challenge when it comes to the um, manufacturing supply chain here in the so, United States. So we do. Uh, so I would agree with you for the most part, but I, I do think a factor that is weighing on everyone's mind is what happened with the opioids. Stimulants and op the reason stimulants are uh, regulated by the DEA is that they're addictive and they're pretty highly addictive. And so we all know what happened with the opioid crisis with rampant um, prescribing and uptake and distribution um, without a lot of responsibility. I think the industry has now retracted from that and has been reticent to actually even fill the quotas that were given. And we put out a statement about that together with DEA a few months ago. Um, but we do have, so in answer to your question though, we do have regular meetings with the DEA. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not aware if there are any components of that that are shielded from public records. So, um, I, and, and uh, you know, these are very regular meetings and they're very important where we transmit what we're seeing and thinking. The decision though about the quota is a DEA decision. It's not an FDA decision. We'll, we'll dig into that a little bit more. I on also feel like I need to get, being a, a board certified clinician, this is also an area where there's a heavy element of um, professional responsibility. Um, we know that underserved uh, people um, are not getting diagnosed the way they should for ADHD and many are not being treated appropriately. Many well-to-do people are using ADHD drugs for other purposes. Um, a little toning up on weight loss would be one example that mm -hmm. we see. And underlying all this is clinical standards for um, getting the right prescriptions to the right people. And I think we have a problem there. Um, as well, I'm sure Dr. Harris China. would say, we don't regulate the practice of medicine, but we are seeing this, and it's something that needs to be taken seriously. Yeah, well, we just we had a hearing just this week in the Select Committee on China about the, the fentanyl um, and all the precursors that they are deliberately subsidizing um, and manufacturing for export, similar to the, the tobacco products and how they're doing that um, for flavored uh, for export only. So I guess my concern would be here with um, if there is a, a challenge with supply, um, are patients then seeking out these other alternatives that are farly more da far more dangerous um, in essence could be laced with these da dangerous substances coming in from China? I'll just say uh, that's a valid concern and one we have to uh, take into account. I feel like since I'm FDA commissioner, all of my relatives from everywhere tell me about their problems. I have a very close, dear relative who does well on a stimulant um, in her studies, but not so well if not, and, and there has been a shortage, we're well aware. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentlelady from Northern Ohio. <laughs> Thank you for knowing that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner, welcome. Um, boy, I don't know where to start here. I got a lot of questions in probably three minutes. So um, uh, my question really is, how dependent is the United States on imported ingredients in pharmaceutical products? Uh, are we 50% dependent, 2%, 75%, all the different ingredients? What, what would be your ballpark guess on that? How, how, how self-sufficient are we inside our borders? Well, it, depends on it depends on how you ask the question, but I'll go through this quickly. I, I spent a lot of time on this, and I would urge you to read an, a report from HHS that came out about two weeks ago that has all the details. But if you said, what about the key starting ingredients, which you can think of as petrochemicals? Most backbone for drugs comes from um, molecules that are petrochemicals, basically. Those are almost all coming from China. So if you say, how dependent are we? We're pretty dependent right now. Why don't we get them here? We got more oil than we know what to do with. I, well, if I could give the second part, which I think has been a point that's, uh, that, um, has caused some confusion. Those petrochemicals are then through um, what chemists do, 
made into um, API, or and that's what people mostly talk about. That's lar that's largely um, in India, and also distributed throughout the world. But India has played a larger and larger role there. Think of it as going from China to India, and to other countries. Um, in terms of why did it get to be that way? Um, China could make it less expensively and didn't have the environmental regulations. And so I'm afraid, you know, this is just my personal view. This is a not in my backyard issue that happened over time where the American industry saw it could get these basic things done at a lower cost. So it all moved there. And it it is a dependence that I think is a national security issue and it's a clinical issue. I'm personally taking four generic drugs, um, but it's not just generic drugs. Um, uh, innovator drugs also have their common backbone from these uh, sources. So there needs to be a real effort to do something about this. I really, you know, in Ohio, we have one million diabetics, <clears throat> and uh, I want to make insulin in Ohio. I need your help in doing that. I don't want imported stuff, and I don't want the people that I represent to have to be precluded from getting insulin uh, or getting better quality insulin uh, by the uh, pharmaceutical companies controlling the dispenser and the patent on the dispenser. So it's my understanding if we try to make insulin in Ohio or heparin uh, in Ohio, that uh, you know there's all these little tricks that are you know tie you up in court for 50 years. And you can't, but I want to make medicine in America. Who can I talk to at FDA to figure out how I do that? And I want to start in my district. I, for heparin, I got more, I represent more hogs than people. So we can get one of the main ingredients for that right from agriculture. <laughs> Why can't we do it? I, uh, in between my two FDA stints, I did a lot of work in Dayton, Ohio. So I'm very familiar with the uh, uh, issues that you have. I just point out a couple of things and I'll try to be quick here. Um, we have asked you for help with regard to the dispenser issue, this interaction of drug and device where it's often used to um, block competition. Yes. Um, we, I have a list of 25 things we're asking for. They're mostly nips and tucks in the regulations so that it um, provides for more competitiveness. So there's one in particular related to that that we'll uh, talk with your staff about. But Thank the you. fundamental issue is um, in the um, the environment that we've been in financially with U.S. industry, the question is, can you make the drug um, at a comparable cost to what it can be made in China and India? And <laughs> so I need to ask your help. I don't think the regulations are holding that back. It's that the cost is higher because American employees get paid more, and this is a um, labor-intensive activity and a technology-intensive activity. And so we subsidize a lot of things in America, but it's not FDA's role, as you know, to, to deal with the economics. We deal with safety and effectiveness. Yes, well, sir, I, I can't, my time is running out. I'm really glad to hear your openness to this. Just because you are a cardiac specialist and the name on the door here is agriculture, uh, we worked several years ago with brilliant farmers who were going out of business because of the uh, agglomeration of the hog industry and the slaughter industry to just a few companies now Smithfield owned by who China right so the same things happening in medicine and so I think we have to go back to the drawing board and figure out how do we unwind this thing and what we did back then was we worked with farmers uh, to develop sterile hogs um, and uh, they earned more money producing sterile hog valves for heart transplants than they did selling in the traditional market for bacon so I think we have to look at this challenge on many levels. And I, with the chairman being a doctor, I hope we can talk about this more because I would like to find prototype um, uh, places around the United States where we could begin to recapture the market. We can talk about heparin on the second round uh, and what happened to us there in 2008. You probably are very aware of that. Uh, tainted ingredients from China that they knew they were doing. It wasn't an accident. So. Uh, we have to make this in America again. Mr. Chair, can I address the generic drug thing for just Please. a minute? Um, I, you'll see in our HHS report, there are a lot of things the FDA does to try to um, prevent or um, mitigate shortages when they occur. 
But the fundamental issue is that for common generic drugs, the risk of shortage is directly related to the price of the drug. And the lower the price, the higher the risk of shortage, because you can't make it in America at the price that's being sold uh, elsewhere. So this is largely a problem of our own making and the way our markets work. The intermediaries were mentioned that, um, who do the purchasing for the health systems and the pharmacies. Um, there's not been a consideration of resilience of the industry um, in those efforts. So this is a bit of a, um, a thing that we have to go through. Um, we could argue about the innovator drugs and their prices. Um, I think they're too high. Other people feel differently. The IRA is dealing with that to some extent. But 95% of prescriptions are generics. And we have a lot of generic drugs where the price is actually below what it would cost to make it and distribute it if you made it in America. And so this demands a market fix, not something FDA can do. Now, having said that, I have a list of seven things that we need at FDA to mitigate the shortages more effectively. Information that we need right now, if we see a shortage coming, we have to get on the phone and call people and pry information out of them so that we can match up a manufacturer who may be able to help with a different one. I believe we should, this information is mostly digitized. We've talked about farms um, as an issue, but in the industry it is digitized and uh, we need uh, that information to quickly respond while we're working on the market fix. We should have some of these pharmaceutical companies before us, Mr. Chairman, and thank, thank. <laughs> well, the thank national you. interest. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Alabama is recognized. Thank you, sir. I wasn't expecting that. Caught me asleep. <laughs> Commissioner, uh, your agency has received uh, multi-letters on the unchecked market of illegal unregulated Chinese vapor products. I know you've been talking about that. It's pouring across our border. These Chinese manufacturers that distribute in the U.S. are treating the FDA as it doesn't even exist by by bypassing your authority, supplying millions of Americans with products you haven't looked at, and cheating a level of lawlessness that makes the FDA regulations look like a joke, to be perfectly honest. A local study in D.C. found that 99 out of 100 that were looked at vapor products uh, were totally illegal. And that just, when I saw the statistic, it really blew my mind. The FDA Center for uh, Tobacco Products is supposed to oversee and keep illegal tobacco products out of the country, or at least get them off the shelves after the fact. I can tell you that your agency is, is uh, doing much of, uh, I'll tell you that if your agency is doing much, if anything, to make a dent in this product. In fact, the Tobacco Center budget and the staff have grown exponentially over the last decade, and the illegal vapor products has even gotten worse. Let me ask you this. In 2009, Congress asked and expected the FDA to publish a rules requirement for, manufacturing, for foreign manufacturers to register with the FDA. They wanted to sell tobacco products in the U.S., it has been more than a decade since the FDA first told us it would issue uh, these uh, regulations for foreign policies. On these communist countries uh, who could not import products unless they were registered. Early this year, the latest uh, 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 unified agency, FDA, yet again, punted that date for rules. Sir? I believe in the work you're doing. I've worked with physicians my entire life, and I, I appreciate what you're doing, doing for this country. And I'm reading your, your bio here, and it says, as a top official of the FDA, uh, that you are committed to strengthening programs and policies and, that uh, enable the agency to carry out its mission and to protect and promote public health. Why? In 15 years, have we not got a rule that is written that we can use to enforce what we need to enforce. I have to say I'm not aware of that specific rule, but to address um, your issue, which I think is Do we very, have a rule in place now to stop these Chinese companies from doing this? I'll have this? to get back to you on that because I, I don't... Listen, in 2009, <laughs> we, we, your, your agency, I know you weren't there in 2009. In 2009, Congress asked and expected the FDA to publish that rule. Well... I, I believe the solution to the problem is what we've already discussed. I, if there's one thing that, that seems to be bipartisan here, it's that 
these vaping products from China are um, not good for this country. They're not even, they're flavored. They're not even sold in China to Chinese people. I think what we need is help from you to have um, a, a system that allows us to do this efficiently to deal with it. There are 300,000 retail stores selling these products. We can't be in every one of them. And let me just mention two things related to what you said. Our budget is basically fixed. It hasn't grown. Um, and we get no user fees from the vaping industry. It's totally, the budget is totally funded by user fees. The vaping industry has gotten off scot-free from paying the user fees. So the money that we're spending to deal with the vaping industry is taken from other sources because there is no specific money uh, to deal with the vapes. So we have a request in to have user fees that would allow us to put many more people on the ground. But again, as I've thought about this a lot, particularly as this problem has grown, I think the solution needs to be something that gets rid of, um, that, that makes it possible to move efficiently to stop this before it gets into 300,000 retail shops that, around That's the, the easiest way to do it, believe it or not. Cut it off. When, when the Chinese start losing product, when we start destroying their products at the ports that they're coming in, then we'll make an impact. I would also suggest that your department put together a skeleton of what you would like to see. doesn't mean that's what will come through this committee and committees like it. But you can help us the most because most committees do not have a doctor that sits as a chairman, and he certainly does a fine job of sifting through some of this. So I would suge suggest that you put this policy together that you would like to see and submit it to us, a finished product, and then let us go through that. Uh, I do, I do feel compelled just to point out. This is my opinion. Uh, I'm sort of thinking yes, over the last few nights. It's not an administration policy at this point, but it, it just seems kind of obvious that if we're going to deal with this particular problem, and I want to distinguish it from other products like the pharmaceutical products, where um, you know we can't just cut them off because they have benefits. Like I, my hypertension is treated by generic drugs that originate in other parts of the world. But flavored vaping products have no health benefit. And so it seems like there could be some agreement about how to efficiently take care of at least that problem. So um, I'll continue to work on it and look forward to working with you, whatever the right solution is. Thank you, sir, and I yield. Thank you, the gentlelady from Maine. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you very much before, uh, for your thoughtful remarks this morning and, and being before our committee. Um, <clears throat> I appreciated the recent remarks I heard you give at the HHS Food as Medicine Summit. Uh, you touched on the need to better understand the impacts of ultra-processed food. Uh, people often think about ultra-processed food as sort of junk food, like donuts, but even breakfast cereal, bread, a lot of things are now packed with additives. I'm very interested in this. Um, and I'm interested in your thoughts about how ultra-processed foods are impacting our health um, and our eating habits. Are they manufactured to be addictive? Can you talk a little bit about how, what the FDA is thinking about ultra-processed foods and any actions you're planning to take? What, a couple of points. Uh, thank you for asking the question. I, people around me know I've become a little bit obsessed with this um, Go for issue. It. <clears throat> um, here, here's what I'd say. We have an overwhelming um, number of studies now that show, there, that show an association between ingestion of ultra-processed foods and bad health outcomes, right, ranging from heart disease to cancer and all sorts of other things. But association is not causation. And so there's a lot of research that needs to be done about how much of that association is due to the things that go along with ultra-processed food, like higher sodium, higher sugar, things that we know um, create health mm -hmm. problems that can be dealt with aside from just calling something ultra-processed. And then we have the issue of what about the ultra-processing itself? It's often a whole series of ingredients that you might think of as natural, but when combined, create a situation that allows the product to stay on the store shelf longer and to taste better to people. And the question is, uh, it's a little bit of this and that mixed together. How do you separate all that out? So we uh, have a trans-government effort now. Um, one thing is just defining ultra-process. There's a common definition, but it needs a lot of research to get it sorted out. 
and we need NIH and CDC to work with us, which they're doing, to get the research done. Because as, as I feel compelled to keep pointing out, we're referees, we don't make the rules. And for us to have a rule that will stand the test of the courts, um, we need the research that really substantiates it and can be defended. So we're, um, we're, we're deeply um, into that. You also brought up something which I just find fascinating, uh, if you'll pardon me for having a little bit of fun today, because I find this fascinating. Uh, the question of whether ultra-processed foods create a situation where when you eat it, you actually are hungrier rather than have um, satisfied is a really interesting question. There is research indicating that in some circumstances that is the case. Um, think of it as potato chips. You ever try to eat one potato chip? You, you can't stop, and, and yet you're eating them. And so, um, and this becomes now integrated with this amazing thing that's happening in pharmaceuticals with the GLP drugs, mm -hmm. which are affecting, and I love this because I had a friend as an intern who worked on it his, his whole career. We thought he was crazy. What is this about neurocircuits between the gut and the brain? And now, of course, there are drugs that affect those circuits, and it's basically an addiction system that goes on whether the ultra-processed food is feeding into that addiction system is one of the key questions. But we can't take regulatory action until we have definitive information. So there's a lot of research that needs to be done. And we don't want to take food off the shelves that has longer shelf life because <clears throat> that'll have the largest in, uh, effect in low-income areas where people can't, where whole foods are not placed. And so... Um, we, we've got to get this right. A lot of research is needed. Um, <clears throat> I have a lot of other questions, but I don't have much time, so let me just follow up a little bit. So uh, do you feel like, uh, and not all these things, of course, happen through this committee, but um, that we need more significant investments at NIH and CDC to give you the kind of information that you need to move forward, whether it's labeling or just making some of those connections on health? Well, you know, I can't recommend funding, but I would just say we need more research okay. that those... Um, we'll just call it research, not money. And I, you know, we have great <laughs> um, leaders now, um, uh, Dr. Bartonoli um, and Dr. Cohen. Uh, we talk a lot, and so everyone's aware of this need. All right. Well, I, um, I need to yield back, but I, I, and I'm very interested in this topic, so I'll, I'll follow up, but I, I do need to just say... Ultra-processed foods, potato chips, I don't know. I come from Maine. We raised a lot of potatoes. I'm not sure it's all about potato chips, but <laughs> no, just, just protecting my farmers. Everything in moderation, I Absolutely. think, is still good no. advice, and I enjoy my donuts and potato chips, but hopefully not too many. Yeah, donuts are over here. Potato chips are very different. So. Anyway, thank you very much. I'll yield back. And thank you very much. The gentleman from Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Commissioner Cal, for joining us here today. Uh, appreciate everything that you do and, and the, the work of your agency. Uh, we all, we enjoy the, I think, the, the best and the safest food supply in the world, and, and that's uh, thanks in part a lot to the work you guys do. But as you mentioned earlier, uh, it, it's all about the tension. We, we strive for perfection. We all want that, but where's the right level of uh, regulatory uh, burden that goes along with it and the cost? And, and candidly, you guys can put out the rules. You don't have to bear the responsibility of the costs that are associated with all those, and that's and we represent folks who do. Uh, I'd like to associate myself with a lot of the comments already made by my colleagues regarding the food traceability rule. Uh, we talked about that. I, I asked you about that last year because uh, it was a fairly fresh ruling at the time, but here we are another year down the tracks, and, and there's still a tremendous amount of uncertainty out there in the industry uh, as to how this is going to be implemented. Uh, Ranking Member Bishop and I introduced the Food Traceability Enhancement Act. We talked about that as far as pilot programs. Um, the difficulty we're facing is folks don't know how they're going to implement that. They, they agree with the concept. They would, they, as you had mentioned earlier, you know, we're looking to figure it out. Uh, there's going to be some form of phasing in. But I kind of get the sense it's like you guys are going to throw it out there and industry is going to figure it out because that's what they do. The, the challenge we have with that, uh, you know, at, at the grower level, they're having to compete against uh, international products that aren't going to have to comply with this. So that's a cost there. If, if they're going to have their, if these farmers are going to be able to market their products, they're going to have to eat that cost or they're not going to be competitive. The groceries, uh, grocery stores, they're going to sell what's, what's available in the store and they're going to pass the cost along to consumers. So at a time we can't afford higher food costs, that's what's going to happen. Uh, there's so much uncertainty around it that cost estimates over the phase into this 
are anywhere from hundreds of millions to as much as 25 billion I've seen over 20 years. No one really knows, but what I, and, and we really do need low cost technology to make this uh, really feasible for the lower, uh, the, the smaller folks out there. I'm really concerned in my community, I have a lot of rural areas in my district that either don't have grocery stores at all, that are truly food deserts, they may be lucky to have a convenience store, or they have one grocery store. And a lot of these folks, the small grocers that don't have the power of the buying power of the big chains are worried that they're not going to be able to compete at all. Uh, I would just really urge you to take a look at maybe giving some, some more specific guidance uh, to help folks and implement some of these pilot programs like we're asking for. But really, I, I, we can come back and you can comment if there's time. I don't have a lot. I did want to move on to one other thing uh, specific to Florida and orange juice. Uh, very, uh, very important to me. My, my district is the largest citrus producer and certainly in Florida and probably one of the largest in the, in the country uh, uh, with respect to orange juice. But in 2022, uh, the Florida orange industry submitted a petition to FDA to lower uh, BRICS. The BRICS uh, content, the sugar content, uh, required for not from concentrate pasteurized orange juice. Uh, there's no effect on the taste, and there's very little effect on the nutrient level. In fact, a lot of people looking at it as they're looking for healthier drink choices would say it's got fewer calories, it's got more uh, vitamin C, lower carbohydrates, all, all those things. So uh, it's it's a good thing for consumers, but if the but more importantly right now for our growers who are struggling to get through greening challenges, the hurricanes and things like that, if the BRICS levels aren't reduced, Florida may be in a position where it can no longer provide Florida or provide uh, pasture, pasteurized orange juice. And so more of the market's going to come from outside the country. Uh, FDA got overwhelmingly positive comments on the petition that was sent out about this. Uh, the no foresee, you know, no real uh, downside that we see. And yet two years later, there's still been nothing done with this. This would be a relatively easy and I think non-controversial fix uh, that FDA could do to help us. Uh, could you commit or comment on uh, getting that rulemaking initiated? Uh, we're going to get it done. Um, you know, the standards of identity uh, started in 1939 with rulemaking, which is such a cumbersome way to deal with this because of uh, the complexity of the regulation and all the things that have to be brought into play. But I think we're close to reaching an accommodation, and we're fully aware this is not the grower's fault. The, uh, changes have occurred in the environment that have led to a change in the content, and as I understand it, there's some tension between accommodating the needs of the growers, which are very legitimate, and the standard of identity, which is meant to preserve the tastes that people are used to. I think we're very close to getting there. There's just some interaction that's occurring uh, to get it to the right place. Is there any kind of timeline we could commit to? I wish to I could that? give you a timeline, but I can't give timelines on uh, rules. Well, so the, the challenge we face is, you know, we're one hurricane away, literally, from completely decimating the industry. And any I, any lifeline we could get right now as they turn the corner on greening. Would really I, I hear you, and we're going to move as quickly as we can. I'm, I'm told we're very close. All right. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. Ms. Underwood. Hi, Dr. Kayla. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. When you testified before this committee last year, I asked about the FDA's progress in finalizing rules to prohibit menthol-flavored cigarettes and cigars, and today there's still no finalized rule. As you know, this is an issue I'm passionate about as a nurse and one that has impacted my own community. Menthol cigarettes disproportionately harm black Americans with over 39,000 black Americans dying from tobacco-related cancers each year. Today, after decades of Big Tobacco's pervasive marketing campaigns, nearly 90% of all black smokers use menthol cigarettes. It's my understanding that the final call at this point is with decision makers higher up in the administration. Dr. Califf, I know that you are very sympathetic to my frustrations with this delay, and I appreciate your efforts. Thank you very much for speaking out about the importance of finalizing this rule now. We know our opponents in Big Tobacco are powerful, well-funded, and well-armed. You've been quoted saying, I've never seen more capable or nastier lawyers than what I experienced in trying to deal with the tobacco industry. Those are very strong words, and I think it's important that we shine a light on what they're doing here. What kind of tactics have you seen tobacco companies take in their efforts to delay and water down FDA's action against menthol? I, I can't speak in detail in a rule which is uh, being finalized, but the tactics of the tobacco industry are well 
described and um, often have to do with having surrogates who are um, paid uh, to express their opinions or um, stalling tactics done through legal maneuvers. And I'm not a lawyer, so I, um, the description of the lawyers, I would just say they're very effective. The public is smart and they recognize these dirty tactics, which is why the menthol ban is popular. A recent poll indicates that 58% of Americans, including 62% of black Americans, support FDA's rule. These numbers matter, especially when we consider that black Americans die at disproportionate rates from smoking-related diseases. If we continue to delay, I'm worried that we'll never get it done. Given the incredible costs black Americans are facing, we can't afford to wait any longer. Now I want to turn your attention to another crisis fueled by big tobacco, youth nicotine use. The CDC's 2023 National Youth Tobacco Survey shows that nearly 2.8 million middle school and high school students use tobacco nationwide. This includes the use of e-cigarettes. FDA is charged with reviewing e-cigarette products before they ever reach the market and end up in a child's hands. Yet despite both statutory and court-ordered deadlines, FDA enforcement is years overdue. As a result of this delay, there are thousands of dangerous and illegal e-cigarette products on store shelves easily available to kids. When, and I'm looking for specific timing here, sir, when will FDA finally complete its PMTA reviews and get these dangerous products out of kids' hands? The, um, as you well know, we've, uh, out of over 26 million applications, we've reviewed 99%. And the really important big market ones uh, uh, brought out in court proceedings by the AEP were 94% done. Um, we should be done by mid-year this year. Now, keep in mind, um, along the way, we have court decisions, mm -hmm. and we also have late um, supplements to the applications with the courts of rule we have to consider. And we talked about delaying tactics that occur. But if there's a court decision that ha causes us to go back and do something different than what we plan to do, that slows things down. So... Um, you know, giving you an ironclad date is impossible. Yes, sir. But we're well within range now. I mean, when I uh, I was I was overwhelmed when I started uh, February two years ago to see the 26 plus million, and then you know we added non nicotine tobacco. That was another million applications. Some of these are hundreds of thousands of pages long, but. I think we now, um, Brian King's doing a great job as the leader, and we got a better process. Reagan Udall gave us a lot of things to do to make us, ourselves more efficient. We're on the way to getting this done. And once we do, then we're in the situation, which I think you wanted and Congress intended, which is in order to put a product on the market, mm -hmm. you will have to get approval before you can put it on the market. Exactly. And But as long as we were behind, that was very hard for us to do and ca has kept us tied up in court much more than we should yes, be. Yes, sir. Well, further delays are completely unacceptable and they're putting our kids at risk. I'm also tracking the rise of other products used by kids like, it, like the nicotine pouches, the Zen products. Kids are drawn to these pouches because of the nicotine levels, the candy flavors, and discrete delivery method making them easy to consume in school and also in social settings. And the FDA has an obligation to regulate those products as well. Um, and I'm worried that as these continue, we're going to see the same story as we've seen with the e-cigarettes play um, out with these pouches. Um, and so hopefully we can have a conversation about that in the future. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Gentleman Chairman. From Washington. If I may just very quickly, since certainly I, we've had an extensive discussion about the vaping products coming in from China, and I, I would just urge you to catch up with the discussion we had because – I think for us to really deal with this effectively, this overwhelming number, we're going to need um, a more efficient system to take care of that. Thank you. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Califf. And, and thanks for that uh, segue for me, because I want to ask you about that as well, The uh, these products coming from China. Uh, but first of all, um, the CTP, the uh, Center for Tobacco Products, first uh, started up in 2009 uh, with about 10 employees. Now it's over 1,200 employees. Uh, it's received in that time period over $8 billion in user fees. Uh, you're intimating that maybe they need more resources to do some of the things you do, so that's a point of discussion. Uh, 
this bu budget request has another $100 million in requests for user fees, uh, so certainly have that conversation. Uh, like last year, and I appreciate your testimony again this year, the vast majority of flavored disposable products available in the United States come from uh, illegal imports from China. And on the surface, to a lot of people, it, sounds, it seems as though the administration is turning a blind eye. I think you would probably take exception with that. However, just like last year, your testimony today notes that more than 26 million tobacco products have been submitted and FDA has resolved 99% of those submissions. Last year, you also stated that enforcement is a critical issue now, and I could not agree with you more. Um, unfortunately, there seems to be a trend that despite over the 1,200 personnel and billions of dollars to date, progress is um, underwhelming at best. Um, Largely because of the center's failure to authorize new products to meet market demand, it's now faced with this rampant illicit vapor market that is uncontrollable, driven by exclusively, again, by these Chinese companies. This right here, this thing that I can hardly hold up because of the weight, is over 150 articles from newspapers around the country, as well as letters from members of Congress in both parties urging the FDA to act on flavored vapes being illegal, Im illegally imported. All of this is in the last 12 months since you were last with us. Uh, last year, you also acknowledged that fentanyl is showing up in these products addressing and addressing that scourge has got to be a whole of government uh, priority and I agree with you on that. I'm also on the China Select Committee. Uh, I'm here with my new chairman of that committee. Um, in your comments, it sounds as though we're on the same page here. You see this as a, as a huge issue and a priority. But maybe the only difference that I can detect is that there's a difference in the level of urgency at the agency. Uh, so I, I'm not trying to be funny, but I'm, I'm wondering why you're not here literally with guns blazing, demanding uh, action here telling us what you're doing, what you see needs to be done, how we can help you uh, address this. You, you, we regulate U.S. companies, and we should. They're easier. They're here. Uh, and that's proper that we do that. But we need to focus on what the, the problem is. And so like some of the other my colleagues here, uh, could you commit to providing this committee with a detailed breakdown of how many personnel are working on this issue, what it is that you're doing, but probably more importantly, what if you had a magic wand, what would you like to do and how can we help you do this? This is, and, and by the way, your statement that we're a referee, not a rule maker, I don't get, I don't understand that. We're always responding to proposed rules uh, from FDA. And so I think there's more here that can be done. And I just, I just need to hear that sense of urgency that this is, truly something that is a priority for FDA. A couple of things off, off the bat. Um, I recognize it myself, but having been an intensive care unit doctor my whole career, that I'm not the greatest at emoting. I I'm, I'm tend to be a calming influence, not a, not a fiery influence, because um, that's an important trait when you're dealing with critically ill people. Yeah. But I think your anal the analogy is this is a critical illness in this country. I, want, I do want to also defend the hardworking people at CTP. I mean, these people work incredibly hard and get just criticism every day. It's hard. It's a tough job, but they're committed. They're public health people. They want to do what they, uh, what they can. Um, as I've already said, uh, well, let me, and also with regard to the money that's gone to CTP, I want to remind you that all we're asking is for the vaping industry to pay its fair share, which it's not doing now. I took note of that. And, so and those people that. will be, that will fund people who will specifically deal with the issues um, that that you're concerned about. And with regard to the rest of it, um, I differ with you in terms of progress being made. We're seeing a steady decline in death rates from tobacco-related illness in this country, but this year alone, we're going to lose 460,000 people to tobacco-related illness, so it's still a very high priority. But we started, when I was a starting cardiologist 
most of my patients were 50-year-old people who were smoking cigarettes and having heart attacks and dying at a young age. That demographic has drastically changed, in part um, due, to this, due to this work. But um, I've already told you that we need to do something different about the importation of products which have no health benefit and not even sold in the countries that are yeah. making them. We're going to need your help to do that because I don't see how we can't put people in 300,000 retail stores. This is going to have to be stopped um, sooner than that. So, Dr. Carl, just like you uh, committed to Mr. Carl, we, we need we need your help to do that. Uh, we right. need we need you to help us understand what, what it is we can do to help you. Yeah, I wanted to point out, too, in the sports analogy, um, when it comes to writing the rule book, the referees actually do make suggestions. So, yes, we make suggestions, but we don't write the laws you do. So mm -hmm. you're, you're perfectly right. To, when you ask us, we will certainly give you um, our best ideas. I look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, before we go on, I think that uh, – the House stands in recess. I believe the chair will call the House back in at 1030 for a single vote with walk off around 11. So uh, the chair's intention to do is to continue the hearing probably till about 1050. And if we have a second round of two minutes or so, that works. But uh, my intention is not to have you come back, have to come back. Uh, you, you're a busy man. You've got other things to do than, than be here. It would not uh, ruin my day. If uh, that, that's what I that's what I imagine. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Califf, thanks for being with us today. Um, I guess I'm concerned. A number of people have asked you what the FDA is doing relative to the illegal vaping products coming in from China, 90% of the market share. Um, I guess the question is, they are clearly bypassing your authority. I guess my question is, what are you doing with the authority you have? And specifically, what authority do you have? Because uh, what I hear you saying, and, and just to follow up on uh, Representative Newhouse, you're asking for additional resources, but I still cannot get a clear understanding of what you're doing with the actual authority that you do have. So, I mean, it's hard in a five-minute space to give you all the details, but let's just say there's a cascade of things that we can do. It starts with warning letters. Okay, let me ask you this. Of the 300,000 stores, how many warning letters have you written? I'd have to get back to you with the exact numbers. One number that I think is useful is we've 40,000 warning letters have gone for selling products illicitly to okay. underage. So it's not a small number. Okay. Um, and then we, uh, but we'll get you the exact numbers on each of these. Uh, then we go to civil monetary penalties, which we can only exert after warning letters have been through several stages. There's like a second warning letter. And, and what have you done in the area of civil monetary? Thousands of civil monetary penalties. Okay. Um, we're now looking at the issue of whether we can cascade civil monetary penalties so that if someone has multiple infractions, the amount assessed goes up. But that's a court proceeding. It's not something that we just give like a traffic ticket. It actually is a significant Have you done proceeding. any court proceedings, uh, an injunction, or anything like that with your well, authority? Then, then we have seizures and injunctions. And uh, we've had several major seizures uh, recently. Um, in order for us to do that, we have to work with the Justice Department because we don't have um, – our own legal staff is not um, – imbued with the um, right to bring these proceedings. We have to reach agreement with the Justice Department, and then we uh, proceed jointly. So as you know, the Justice Department has multiple priorities also, and um, that um, is something that, you know, they work closely with us. We um, collaborate, but we have to reach agreement to go forward. And we have had significant seizures and injunctions, but nowhere near the um, – number that would stem the tide of what you're describing, so and I'm not message, arguing with you The there. message is not getting out there that if if you go down this road, there are consequences. Is that accurate? I'm not so sure that's the case, but um, I'd say the um, ability of the industry to evade and change what they're doing 
I mean, if you think about 26 million products, that's not like 26 million different drugs. That's mixing different flavors of vaping, for example. So we shot one vaping product down, it shows up down the street with a different, slightly different mixture. So um, this is something we really got to work you tell, on. Can you tell which ones are FDA approved and which ones are not? We have um, a website that has, there are 23 approved uh, vaping products. And so um, there are, you know, how many vaping products do you need approved to meet the public health need, which is uh, helping people transition from combustible tobacco to a less mm -hmm. dangerous substance. Um, yes, we can, we can tell that. So if you see anything that's not one of those 23, that would be an illegal. And the product. retailers all know this. This is not a secret. Okay. Well, I look forward to working with you on, you know, developing a more efficient system, as you've mentioned, and seeing what we can do to, to stop this problem. Just switching gears quickly, um, FDA's approach to regulating dairy terminology being used for non-dairy products, particularly the term milk. Uh, my understanding is the court rulings that you cited don't prevent the FDA from requiring disclaimers such as substitute and alternative on plant-based dairy Im imitators. Would the FDA require the use of such terms to improve consumer awareness and also reduce poor health outcomes, particularly in children? Um, as you well know, I mean, first of all, I'm an avid milk drinker myself, so I'm sensitive to this. Um, but as you well know, the two key things for us are, can the consumer distinguish um, milk from a cow from other things that are called milk? And the second is, are they aware of the nutritional differences, which is what you're referring to in terms of health? And so all of our regulations um, will make sure that that's the case. So it may require the, a disclaimer on there, uh, substitute or alternative? If it's, if it's needed. Um, also keep in mind, I've mentioned the courts already. We have numerous court cases related to what um, substances are called when there's, um, and we have to also keep that in, in mind. But that doesn't prohibit you from doing that, is that correct? Um, prohibit or interpret in a way that makes it unlikely to succeed are two different concepts, perhaps. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, I now yield myself uh, five minutes for questioning. Um, so on, on a variety of issues, first with, with regard to menthol, look, I understand the risks, and anesthesiologists, believe me, you know the problems we had with uh, chronic smokers, uh, with uh, the airway issues and things. Uh, but it would seem to me that menthol, that, that you, you'd, you might want to provide an off-ramp. And for instance, menthol-flavored vaping might be an off-ramp. So I would hope that the FDA realized that not all flavorings are necessarily the same. Some are very reasonable off-ramps. Some might not be as reasonable. And when you make the rulemaking, I hope you take that into consideration. Second thing, I'm glad you talked about processed food being potentially addictive. Because I would hope, as a physician, you'd agree with me that uh, sugar is addictive. I mean, it just is. You can Google it. Uh, you know, addiction, uh, it, it's a recognized addiction because of the effect it has on the body. And I hope you would join me and not necessarily in your official role, perhaps as just as a physician, in saying that it's about time uh, that we restrict sugar-added foods from the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Because we know it's addictive. It leads to diabetes. It leads to uh, probably type type 2 diabetes. Leads to obesity, and it's about time that we actually uh, look look to the taking care of the health of the individuals who are on the supplemental nutrition assistance program. But I want to spend the balance of my time on two issues that partic that I uh, want to discuss. First is the marijuana rescheduling decision. I think it is absolutely wrong to have abandoned the previous five factor test, but I understand why. Because the very first factor is drugs chemistry must be known and reproducible. Well, obviously, marijuana's chemistry is not known and reproducible because if you go into a marijuana dispensary, there are about, I don't know, I haven't been in one, but there are probably 50 different products there, all with a different variety, all with a different THC concentration, CBD concentration. Marijuana is not a drug, it is a group of things. 
Uh, some of which, by the way, I would assume that the combustibles in marijuana, just like we worry about the combustibles causing cancer and uh, tobacco addiction, that I would assume that some of those are com some of those combustibles also could cause cancer. And I, therefore, I uh, again, I'm just going to ask one simple question. You know, it says that uh, one of the five-part tests, the drug must be accepted by qualified experts. And even under the two-factor test, it says that a qualified expert organization have opined in favor, and government agencies is one of them. Has did the FDA consult with Dr. Volkow at NIH? I mean, she is the head of the Institute for Drug Abuse. Did you consult with her about the wisdom of rescheduling marijuana? NIDA has... Um uh, has a um, role in the process, and um, this is a very specific question, Doc. Did you discuss this with Dr. Volkow? Uh, the agency discussed it with NIDA. I'm not sure about the. Uh, I talk with Dr. Volkow all, all the time. And you're aware so. that she is adamantly opposed to making marijuana more broadly available and rescheduling it. I'm, uh, I'm aware of her opinions, Okay, yes. good, because I, I would hope that we think that she is, like, the expert in the country uh, on it, and I hope you would have taken that into consideration, but I suspect you took it in very minor considerations, having come up with that recommendation uh, to uh, reschedule um, marijuana. I just, think, I just think it's a dangerous move uh, and very uncharacteristic of, of the FDA, which deals with drugs. Um, I would ask, like, which drug is it that you suggested rescheduling? THC, THC-CBD combinations, THC-CBD well, and all the rest. Well, I, <laughs> Again, I'm just frustrated. But let me move on to the last uh, thing, because um, every time I think you've been in front of this committee, I've asked you about the horse tweet. My understanding is that in a court agreement, FDA agreed to finally take down the horse tweet, right, on ivermectin, an off-label use of the drug. Now, given that the, given the FDA's obvious concern about off-label uses, even of drugs that are considered pretty darn safe, is the FDA considering a REMS or black box warning on puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones, given the fact that since we spoke last about this, the CAS report, Systematic Review, came out from the NIH over in the UK, and that the, NI, that the National Health Service in the UK has decided to stop um, providing these drugs under the National Health Service because of the lack of evidence that they actually work or that they provide a benefit. So I've got to ask you, is the FDA going to take the uh, CAS systematic review into consideration and either black box or REMS one? Because, as you must be aware, there are online sources for puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones. And as you appreciate as a physician, if the argument is that these patients are at high suicide risk, I doubt most psychologists or psychiatrists would think that online counseling for someone at a high risk of suicide is probably the most important, is probably the best way. And that, and again, a REMS would just say, well, yeah, you have to actually see a patient and talk to them before you prescribe it. So is the FDA considering those two? We're we, of course, are going to consider any information that may be available. You're also aware there is no indication uh, now approved by FDA for these drugs uh, for the reasons that you gave. Uh, Correct. We, we'll just do everything like for, we can to stop the... And, and again, um, just to remind uh, you, for ivermectin, there was no indication, but the FDA on its own went to go after, and I know because, again, as I told you, I had a license complaint made against me for, for prescribing it one time, off-label a safe drug. Now, here we got an off-label that's able to be prescribed online in minors, and you, my impression is you don't think that that requires a black box or a REMS. Well, we're going to take in all the data and information that we can and make a, a regulatory decision, which, as you know, the commissioner doesn't make the regulatory decisions. The drug part of the FDA does. So we, we'll look at the data. I appreciate your candor. Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to... Just again, we've got to keep it pretty strictly to two minutes if we want to get, it, go, uh, get make the votes. Thank you. I've been pleased to see the administration's support uh, for 
research utilizing alternatives to animal testing. And many parts of the government uh, in other countries are working on this. And so there are so many modern tools at our disposal to understand the impact of medical products on the human body, even perhaps AI. Uh, this is about having the best possible research uh, as results in animals don't always line up with the results in humans. Uh, so we fully funded your 2023 and 2024 requests on the issue. Can you talk about any notable successes uh, in, in the effort briefly? I think the modeling um, effort is moving along, both um, extrapolating from in silico models, um, organs on a chip, all that, into humans, and also totally virtual AI. But we're a long way right now from substituting animals when we go to give a drug to a human being for the first time. I mean, remember that 90% of drugs that go into phase one testing into human studies don't make it to market because of unexpected toxicity already, and we don't want to be giving drugs to children or adults with serious disease without having proper testing done beforehand. So we're working on it. It's a big focus of our Office of Chief Scientists and our Arkansas um, National Center for Toxicologic Research. Thank you very much. The gentlelady from Iowa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Commissioner, do you have any tools in your toolbox to um, expedite the regulatory environment around reshoring um, some of those companies manufacturing overseas? Um, I, I understand the financial incentive element, and we talked a little bit about, uh, my colleagues uh, mentioned, you know, the labor market um, being one of those contributing factors. Do you have any tools to move up that regulatory time frame to speed that up? There are potentially some tools, but I'd really like to get back with you and, and your colleagues specifically about that. If there is a serious effort by government to, um, I think of as reshoring and nearshoring, mm -hmm. uh, we have 8 billion people in the world. They all need access to generic drugs that are high quality and low cost. We have a special need here. And if there's an effort that's you know policy driven to do it, we want to play our role. Um, in other cases where we've needed to have regulatory flexibility, um, often, um, as I said, the, the rule book might need to be tweaked a little bit to make that happen. Okay, well, we'll look forward to the referee's comments on um, how we might be able to help you with that. Um, one quick question in the time I have left. Um, it's on overseas inspections, which obviously plays into our need to, to reshore as well. Um, in 2022, a report found FDA inspected 6% of overseas plants down from pre-pandemic levels. You and I have talked about this, obviously, access being really, really important. Can you talk a little bit to the number of facilities inspected in 2023? And in your assessment, do you sufficiently inspect enough facilities and have the access you need? We're on the way back, but we're not there yet. And um, so it's not enough. But I'd also point out what is moving very rapidly is the digital infrastructure to do things in between the inspections that make a difference. If you think about just being in a place once every three years or once every five years, a lot can happen. But we learned a lot during the pandemic about um, digital technologies to look at processes within uh, firms and also we're working very hard on a quality management um, grading system um, and with hopes that a public-private partnership will be formed so that the firms that are doing the best job um, get preference in terms of contracting by um, health systems. But fundamentally um, our reorganization is really focused on um, doing everything we can to put the emphasis on the, um, we call them investigators in the field. The people, you think about, let's say, going into a firm in China um, as a U.S. government representative doing an inspection. That's a tough environment. We've got to treat these people well. And um, I've d been doing a lot of government travel. I'll just say, having been an alphabet executive, it's not quite the same. Mm -hmm. And so... When you think about the knowledge base, the expertise, um, so a lot of our reorganization is really oriented towards um, in increasing the number of inspections, but also making them much more effective. So I think you're on, uh, you should be looking at us on this, and we welcome the. Um, Thank you, Commissioner. Well, Thank you very much, Thank gentlelady you. from Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, doctor, again, thank you for appearing before us. Uh, every place I go, schools, uh, talking to sheriffs, and I say, what's the number one issue on your mind? The answer always is mental illness. 
And 75% uh, of our inmates now in our local jails are mentally ill. Our uh, situations in our schools coming out of the pandemic, you have a sense of what's going on there. Um, my bottom line question is, what more can FDA do, if anything, uh, to work with respected clinicians around the country to try to get additional drugs uh, um, examined by FDA uh, to try to provide a better road forward in a field where we don't have the best answers. Um, and it's costing human lives and it's costing society greatly for this. Um, they are very, very ill people. Uh, last year, we uh, wrote you a letter, and um, it concerned one of the many old drugs called clozapine. And uh, we're interested in uh, any of more details you can find, you can give us today on the specific regulatory actions the FDA plans to take based on the findings of the ongoing studies and reevaluation of the clozapine REMS. Um, it's my understanding that FDA gets very few requests for review of psychiatric drugs. Is that a correct understanding? I'd say the pipeline in mental health is a small fraction of, for example, oncology. It's, it's a huge issue. I brought in special people into the commissioner's office to help look across the agency to see what we can do. But as you know, we don't make the drugs. So um, there's something about our marketplace and science which is not responding to this crisis that we have in the U.S. That is correct. And that's one of the questions I'm going to ask for more detail. Uh, what can you uh, your agency do to work with respected clinicians who practice in this most difficult field uh, to advance medications so vital to stability uh, and uh, uh, for these very mentally ill people. We don't, we seem to be failing as a country. I, well, and, I thank the gentle lady and perhaps you can respond in writing uh, to that because again, votes have started. The gentleman from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just real quickly. Thank you, Dr. Carlip. Um, you know, several of continue to raise concerns about these Chinese vapor products. It's a obviously very bipartisan issue and one we all share. We need to be aggressive on. Um, so I believe you currently have the authority to issue import alerts. Uh, I, I've seen that at least two have been issued. But um, and you, you alerted to the fact that certain products go into commerce from China and they, they know, know that they have that ability. Can you tell me why you haven't issued a, a product-wide import alert on these illegal vaping products? And, and wouldn't that be something that would be a great uh, start? I'd have to get back with you on that. These things are adjudicated with the Justice Department, and, um, but we'll specifically get back with you as to whether that's a feasible route. Okay. Is there anything you're doing right now to work to improve coordination with the CBP on Re reducing the amount of these products coming in? We have uh, our um, border, um, people that are at the border representing FDA uh, meet with CBP all the time. I've personally been out um, to San Francisco, for example, and also New York where the, that interaction uh, is so important. So yeah, yes, we are working with CBP. It could always be better. Um, it, it's a they, they've got a number of issues, too, as you're well aware that they're dealing with. Well, the, the, just to reiterate, this is a huge problem that we need to get a handle on and look forward to working with you. Agreed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Gentle lady from Maine. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you again for your time today. I'll try to be quick here, and we can always follow up about this, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, grass. Um, so many uh, foods contain chemicals that haven't been rigorously reviewed by the FDA. Things like corn tortillas have propyl paraben, in the ingredients list, that's banned in Europe. It's recently been banned in California. Under federal regulation, this is one of those grass or generally recognizes safe loophole chemicals. Under the existing process, food companies don't have to submit a formal food additive petition, which triggers a pre-market safety review if the product is generally recognized as safe. For years, they had to do that. But after a backlog of those petitions, then the FDA established a voluntary notification process. So I know you've mentioned and we're talking about the overhaul of the human food programs, and I'm very pleased to see uh, Jim Jones appointed as the deputy commissioner for human foods, given his background on chemical safety. But can you share a little bit, if not 
if not a long discussion now, but how FDA is prioritizing food safety, addressing the food chemicals on the market, and what are you going to do to close that grass loophole? Well, there, you know, there are three pillars to the food safety. Uh, one is microbiologic. The second is nutrition. The third is the chemical issue. And it's been underserved at the FDA and um, underfunded and underemphasized. Jim Jones coming in as the head of the Human Foods Program with a history of working uh, at EPA, very seasoned in this regard. We're beefing out the program already, uh, pulling people into it, but um, it is part of our appropriations request to have funding for a group which is larger uh, to deal with this. We're in an expanding uh, period of knowledge and with big data, we can look at relationships that didn't exist before, but also with big data, we find all kinds of associations, some of which are important and some of which aren't, and we have to use science to sort those out. Well, I have to yield back, but um, I'd like to follow up with you, and certainly glad to see you're doing some work on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, and to uh, close it out, the gentlelady from Massachusetts. Illinois. Thank you, Mr. I'm Chairman. Sorry, Illinois, but it's I've okay. done that again. Hi, Dr. Califf. <laughs> Women across America are facing an unprecedented assault on our health and our freedoms. In the wake of the Dobbs decision, extreme MAGA Republicans across the country are raising raging war on comprehensive reproductive health care, and one line of attack has targeted mifepristone, a safe and effective medication used to end a pregnancy. Just last year, the Republican majority on this subcommittee advanced a spending bill that would reduce the FDA's decision to allow mifepristone to be delivered by mail. Republican-led efforts in 15 states across the country have resulted in a complete ban on abortion, including the mailing of mifepristone. In 14 additional states, access to mifepristone is restricted. And with a looming Supreme Court decision that could limit access even further, American women are counting on leaders like you and the Biden-Harris administration to fight back. Can you share an update on what FDA is doing right now to protect and expand mifepristone access, especially in states with abortion bans, and how are you preparing now to ensure that this access is not further restricted by the Supreme Court this spring? I really do appreciate the question, but as you know, this is under Supreme Court consideration right now, so I can't give detail. I'll just say, what I can say is we stand by our previous decisions. Um, we've used the science and we believe that drugs that are safe and effective for their intended use should be available to people who need them. Well, we know that their attacks have nothing to do with protecting women. Data overwhelmingly shows that mifepristone is safe and effective. History serves as a stark reminder that restrictions on abortion only serve to drive an underground, leading to a rise in illegal and unsafe procedures, placing women's lives at risk. And that's why I fully support the FDA's move to eliminate the in-person dispensing requirement for mifepristone and to extend its availability at retail pharmacies. Dr. Caleb, thank you for your leadership on this issue. I yield back. I thank the gentlelady from Illinois. <laughs> again, once again, once you get above that Mason-Dixon line, all those states look alike. <laughs> Come spend some time with us, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> it's beautiful all across the country. Uh, uh, Mr. Bishop, in closing comments. Yeah, thank you for your testimony, Dr. Califf. Uh, along with what we've discussed, I'm sure there'll be additional questions for the record and look forward to timely responses. So thank you for your testimony today. Thank you very much, Commissioner Kell. Thank you, and thank you for your candor and, and, and your answers. We really appreciate, uh, the, you know, the straightforward responses you, you give. Once again, today's discussion touched on many important issues that impact every single American, as you know uh, the FDA does. I look forward to working with you as we move through our fiscal year 25 process. As a reminder, if members would like to submit questions for the record, please submit those to the subcommittee math within seven days. The subcommittee is adjourned.